Happy hauntings, horror fans, and welcome to Megan's Murder Movies. I'm your host, Megan, and today we're going to try our best to untangle the spectacular Us by Jordan Peele. I'm so excited to talk about this film. The music, a jam, the cast, magnificent, the spooks, amazing. Um, and that's what I love and hate about Jordan's movies is that you only get to witness, like, the initial oh my gosh, what's actually happening one time. Like when you watch it over again, it's still great, but you only get that twist and turn, what the fuck feeling once. And so I wish that I could go back in time and watch all of his movies for the first time again, because the twists at the end are so good. Or when you find out like what's actually happening, it's so mind blowing, very Twilight Zone. And I just love it. And that's why with his new film, nope, the trailer just dropped like a week ago, I think. I'm staying away from as much talk about it as possible because people are trying to dissect exactly what's gonna, what it's gonna be about from the trailer. And I just wanna go and have that two hours with just me, myself, and whatever craziness comes out of Jordan's brain. Anyway, without further ado, let's jump into this episode. Remember this podcast will contain spoilers, so listen at your own risk. Okay, now for a little summary. So a family is attacked by doppelgangers while on a beach vacation, leading the mom to process a traumatic event that happened when she was a little girl. That is as uh, vague as I'm trying to be without spoiling too much until we get into the scene by scene breakdown. All right, let's get into a cast breakdown. So first we'll start with Lupita Nyong'o. She plays Adelaide Wilson or Addie. Uh, she also plays the character of Red. And Lupita attended Yale University, like their drama school for her master's degree, which is super awesome. Uh, she was in 12 Years a Slave. She was also in a Broadway show called Eclipsed, which she was nominated for a Tony Award for. She stars in the Star Wars trilogy. She was also one of the voices in the 2016 Jungle Book that was released. She was Nakia in Black Panther. So aside from acting, Nwanga also supports historic preservation. She's vocal about preventing sexual harassment, working for women and animal rights. Uh, in 2014, she was named the most beautiful person or the most beautiful woman by People Magazine. Um, and then in 2019, she wrote a children's book. She has narrated a Discovery Channel docuseries, Serengeti, and she was named one of Africa's mo 50 most powerful women by Forbes. She's just amazing, and I just want to support all of the stuff that she does. And so anytime I see that she's like cast in anything, um, I try to see it if I can, because she's just very talented and love supporting her and her work. Next, we have one of my favorite actors, Winston Duke, who plays Gabriel or Gabe Wilson. He also plays Abraham. Winston actually plays M'Baku in uh, the like, Marvel Cinematic Universe for Black Panther, Avengers Infinity War, and then he also made an appearance in Avengers Endgame. He's also headlining in the Apple TV drama series Swagger. Uh, he also starred alongside Mark Wahlberg in the Netflix thriller Spencer Confidential. In July of 2021, Winston Duke played Bruce Wayne in a podcast audio drama called Batman Unburied, which I haven't listened to yet, but I really want to. Um, I'd love to see him play Batman, like, on the big screen. I think that he would be great for that. Um, I think that'd be really cool to see, like, a black Batman. Um, so whoever needs to make that happen, uh, this is my request to you to make that happen because I would love to see it. Um, also super talented, like, just, I feel like... Uh, even though a lot of his roles aren't specific comedic roles, you know, like Avengers is very action and fast paced. Um, and then, of course, you know, Us is like a, a psychological thriller slash horror movie. And so the idea that he's such his comedic timing, though, like and I don't know, I, it has to be a combination of him because in all of what all of the things that I've seen him in, he has such great comedic timing. So they can write these really great lines for him that are, you know, really good comedic, just like one-liners. But the way that he delivers them and just the choices that he makes, I don't know, just 10 out of 10, big fan of Winston Duke. Okay, and then next we have Shahadi Wright Joseph as Zora Wilson or Umbra. Uh, she is an American actress, singer, and dancer, best known for us. And then she was also, uh, she voiced young Nala in The Lion King. And then she also starred as Little Inez in Hairspray Live. And she does such a great job as Zora, like... Uh, I don't want to say it's my favorite character, but she's definitely up there as one of my favorites in this film. 
she's got the total like final girl vibes that you would see from like a regular slasher movie and so i think that that's why i love zora's character so much it's just very much reminds me of like um sydney prescott and uh lori from halloween yeah just it gives me those vibes which i love Next, we have Evan Alex, who plays Jason, the son of, like, Addie and Gabe, uh, and then he also plays Pluto. He's known for us, the kid, and kids reenact. Next, we'll move on to the so talented Elizabeth Moss, who plays Kitty Tyler and Delilah. Um, she began acting in the early 90s, playing Zoe Bartlett in West Wing. Uh, she also played Peggy Olsen in Mad Men. And one of her like biggest roles is June Osborne in The Handmaid's Tale, which has been like super well received, I guess you could say. Uh, you know, hu huge, huge uh following for Handmaid's Tale. Great book, um, but the show is pretty good. She also played in Girl Interrupted, Get Him to the Greek, The One I Love, The Square, The Invisible Man, which I heard was pretty good, Shirley, which I liked. She's been in so many things. I'm sure you would recognize her if you saw her from something, even if it was just like like trailers or things like that, because Elizabeth Moss has been in so much stuff. Next, we have Tim Heidecker, who plays Josh, and then he also plays Tex. And so he's an American comedy writer, director, actor, and musician. He's best known for one half of the comedy duo Tim and Eric, alongside Eric Wareheim. He also acted in the film Bridesmaids, Tim and Eric's Billion Dollar Movie, The Comedy, Ant-Man and the Wasp, and then, of course, Us. He also co-hosts a uh, film review web series called On Cinema and stars in the comedy series Decker alongside Greg Turkington. So he just does he, honestly, it seems like a very busy man, booked and busy, but he's got a pretty fun role as Josh. Next, we'll talk about Yaha Abdul-Mateen II. He plays Russell Thomas, and he also plays Wieland. Um, so he portrayed David Kane, the Black Manta, in the DC Extended Universe Aquaman. Um, he was also in The Trial of the Chicago Six on Netflix, and he also portrayed Cal Abar in the series on HBO Watchmen, which he won a primetime Emmy for. Um, he also starred in episodes of The Handmaid's Tale and Black Mirror. He was also in The Matrix Resurrections. Um, again, super talented. Um, I liked the the trial of the Chicago Seven. Very talented. He's not in the in the film too too much. He plays young Addie's father, um, and so he's kind of only in like flashbacks. You don't get to see him a whole lot. And then we'll go to. The one who plays Addie's mother is Anna Diop, who plays Rain Thomas, or Ur and then she also plays Eartha. So she um, appeared in Everybody Hates Chris. She also guest starred in Lincoln Heights, Whitney, and Touch. She was in the supernatural drama series The Messenger. She also appeared in the series Quantico. And she plays Starfire in the new, like, Titans show that DC is doing. That's super, super good. I love her as Starfire. Um, definitely go check out Titans if you haven't yet. I think it's on HBO now. Next, we have Callie Sheldon as Becca, who also plays Lo. She was in the... She's also starred in Novel Romance, Life, and Friends. And then we have Noelle Sheldon, who plays Lindsay and Nix. And she was also in Novel Romance, Life, and Friends. Next, we have Madison Curry, who plays a young Addie. And she also plays the young version of Red. Uh, shortly before Us, Madison was cast as a series regular on the show Bless This Mess, alongside Lake Bell and Dax Shepard for one season. And then we have Ashley McCoy, who plays the teenage version of Addie and the teenage version of Red. And I couldn't find any information for her, so I'm guessing that this is her only role. I searched her up and, and couldn't find anything else. Her IMBD um, only had us as, as roles that she had done. So I, th I think that that might be all for her. 
All right, so now that we've gone through the cast, let's get into some fun facts about the movie. So Jordan Peele revealed that he actually has a fear of doppelgangers and rabbits, I guess. Um, he said on a Seth Meyers interview that he always had this vision of seeing, seeing himself across the subway platform and just kind of thought, if that's not creepy enough, what if the other you sort of just smiled at you? That just kind of played in his imagination for a while, and that's where part of the film came out of. During the opening scene where we see young Adelaide, played by Madison Curry, she's seen on the couch watching TV and a Hands Across America commercial is on. And next to the TV, there are a few VHS tapes, including one for the 1984 horror film Chud, which is about humanoid monsters responsible for disappearances of mostly people experiencing homelessness, um, like living underground. And so if you've seen both of the films, you'll know how much Chud seems to have influenced Peel's Us. And so Chud is like an acronym for Cannibalistic Humanoid Underground Dwellers. And so basically they come up and get people and eat them and it's... it's uh, I've not seen it. I've, like, seen clips of it. It's, uh, honestly not on the top of my list, but maybe I should give it a shot. If you want me to watch it for the podcast and do the breakdown, uh, let me know, and maybe I'll, I'll do it if enough people want to see it. So then one of the main struggles from the film is that the whole point of it is doppelgangers. And so the other actors in the film and Lupita mentioned how difficult it was because they would, you know, play their one role and then the next day or later that day, they would have to play the opposite side. And you, you don't get that back and forth with yourself, obviously. And so Jordan, I guess, would pretend to be that other person. And so he would sit and he would watch, say, Lupita act as Addie. And then the next day when she was playing Red, he would pretend to be Addie and he would try to deliver the lines with the same mannerisms and movements and delivery as the day before. And so Winston Duke revealed that it was really interesting because it felt like they were speaking and reacting to themselves because Peel would put a lot of effort into the mimicking, which I think is really cool. And just he just seems like the best person to work with. So Lupita Nyong'o shared that she prepped for kind of the voice that she puts on for this film by speaking with a doctor, a vocal therapist, and a dialect coach to develop a speech pattern similar to that of someone diagnosed with spasmodic dysphonia. Um, so it's also known as laryngeal dysphonia, and the disorder causes spasms in your throat muscles, which result in vocal distortion. And she said that her performance is not a direct copy of the real disorder, but that she did study it while fleshing out who the character is and how she speaks. And it's not Megan's Murder Movies if we don't talk about the soundtrack. So the soundtrack for us was composed again by Michael Abels. We chatted about him in Get Out. They worked together on that. And according to NPR, Peel was already planning on working with Abels again. Um, but it became mandatory to him when Steven Spielberg, I guess, actually suggested it. And Spielberg uh, had kind of suggested that him and... Um, him being Peel. So Peel and Abel's collaboration is very similar to that of Spielberg and John Williams. And so, side note, I have this really funny story about Steven Spielberg. Um, I, we had to do this project for a class that I was in during my undergraduate degree. We had to make this video for one of our like final projects in the class. But a lot of the people in the class didn't read the syllabus. And so my group was the only group that actually did the video. Everyone else just did PowerPoints. So as my group is up there, like, prepping everything and getting things ready, I was the one who ended up taking on the role of, like, introducing our video, which I had not prepared. And so I kind of just was rambling, um, and I kind of low-key ended up threatening Steven Spielberg, suggesting that our little fake mockumentary <laughs> movie for this civil rights class was, uh, was gonna be better than his movies. And I also did finger guns in front of the whole class. And my two college friends still like to remind me of that day and me threatening Steven Spielberg. So Steven Spielberg, if you're out there, I apologize. But also, I really liked what we did with that project. So I don't know, take with that what you will. But back to Michael Abels. So his score kicks in early in the film with a track titled Anthem that features a choir chanting. So if you'll remember in the Get Out episode, the chants were warnings that were, that were in the language, uh, the Swahili language. 
that's not the case for us. It's just a nonsense language that Abel's made up. He just made up the syllables. He said that it wasn't really anything fancy. Next, we have one of my favorite little fun facts is a nod to the king and the king being Stephen King. So the presence of the creepy twins in us is considered by some people to be a nod to Stephen King's source material for The Shining. And then there's also another fun little connection who I didn't bring up in the cast because he's only there for a very, very brief amount of time. But at the very beginning scene at the boardwalk where we see um, Russell with young Adelaide, then they're playing like that that uh, baseball game or that like game where you knock the things down. Um, so the guy running that booth or that carnival game, whatever you want to say, is actually Jack Nicholson's grandson. Duke Nicholson. And so, of course, Jack Nicholson is famous for playing Jack Torrance in the Stanley Kubrick film The Shining, which is absolutely amazing. If you have not seen it, I will have a lot to say about The Shining and Dr. Sleep, but that is beside the point. But Duke Nicholson is Jack Nicholson's grandson. And I guess the note that Jordan Peele gave to Duke Nicholson is is to play it like the bartender in The Shining. Um, and his names are uh, Danny. So like his, I guess, real character name. And then his doppelganger name is Tony, which is a direct reference to The Shining. So that's really fun. Um, and then another really cool fact, which just kind of highlights the fact that Lupita is just a phenomenal actress, is that on days when she played Red, she stayed in character all day long. She would not come out of it. She was in that like very intense character. And so Shahadi Wright Joseph <laughs> talked in an interview about how she kind of spooked her out a little bit. She says she would get really into character and wouldn't talk. It was kind of creepy. And when she did speak, she would use that voice and just stare like very intently at the cast. So this is just a fun little uh I guess wardrobe fun fact. So the tethered versions of all the characters, they all wear this single leather driving glove on one hand in the film. And I guess with, um, I guess during an interview with BBC Radio 1, Peel revealed that not only is the single glove scary, but it also relates to three pop culture figures in the 80s, Michael Jackson, Freddy Krueger, and OJ Simpson. And I remember the first time I watched this, I was like, this very much reminds me of Freddy Krueger. Um, and then, of course, we have the whole Michael Jackson thriller uh, kind of nod with the shirt that Addie wants when they're at the the boardwalk. Jordan Peele also acknowledged that it really makes for a quick and easy Halloween costume. You just do the, the one brown, like, driving glove with the red jumpsuit and you are good to go. All right. So then the underground where kind of all of the tethered people live is called the underpass and that's never explicitly stated but jordan peele just said that that's what it's called um he also said in a los angeles times interview i don't tell you how large or expansive it is and in my mind it is quite large and expansive i won't give the borders but they are there means down there um and so i personally think the borders are the entire united states because there's that line in the very beginning which we'll get to about how there's tons of like unused tunnels under the continental United States. And so I wonder if like those are the borders and Addie says that she thinks that the family should go to Mexico, which like she would know that that's possibly a safe place. Again, we will get to that. There's a few more fun facts that I want to talk about first. One of the big ones is just kind of the theme of symmetry in the film. And so there's this um, biblical verse that is... Uh, referred to a lot, the 1111 one. Um, and it's, I guess, a passage from Jeremiah. I am not a biblical person. I do not know the Bible. So this is just what I'm finding online. But apparently the verse is, therefore, thus said the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. It's very intense. Um, it kind of goes to what we'll talk about in in the in the scene by scene breakdown when red is kind of chosen as the leader and viewed like a prophet within the tethered community i guess you could say it's very much cult like jordan says at one point that i think one of the breakthroughs in the writing process was realizing that the dynamic of the tethered was 
occult, and that they have complete faith in their messiah, which is red, and to ultimately imply that them being the dark side of us, we are an occult as well, just a less scary one on the surface. And so I think that's really cool, just kind of the parallels. Um, and I remember when I watched this for the first time in theaters, I was like, I wish I knew the Bible so that I knew what what the 1111 verse was. Um, And so then the last thing that I want to talk about is there's a line that I think is probably going to be debated for a while. And so when the, you know, the Wilsons kind of first meet their tethereds, when they kind of break into their house, um, Gabe asks who they are. Like, who are you? Why are you doing this? The, The classic horror questions when you're being attacked. And Red responds with the words, we're Americans. And so for Jordan Peele, uh, he says that it raises a lot more questions to ponder. It's so satisfying to me in a horror movie when a question is answered, but it only remains scary if the answer raises new questions. And so I think that that kind of answer of we're Americans does just that. He says that the line also reiterates the reality of the doppelgangers. Uh, He said, I wanted to have a moment where she declared pretty early on without saying these words, look, we're from here. We're human beings that are from this soil, which of course you go on to find out, oh yes, they actually are. And so he says, I think us can apply to anyone, human beings in general, your family, your country. And so for me, it was my country and the duality of society. And so I think it's really, really interesting because, you know, you can sit and and say the whole movie, you know, he kind of hopes that we're on one side. You know, he hopes that we're rooting for the the regular people or the people who are not, you know, in the red jumpsuits because they're not committing murders and they're not doing these things. And then when we come to find out the the major twist at the end and we go, oh my gosh, like maybe maybe there isn't as big of a difference as we think there is. Like it's it's very interesting kind of the just the duality of society that that he kind of hits at at the end there. So we'll talk more about it that at the end when we get to the crazy twist. Um I'm sure if you're watching there, or I'm sure if you're listening to this, you know what the crazy twist is, but I just, it still gets me every time when I see that scene and you kind of like, you get that confirmation. Even if you suspected something was up, once you get that confirmation, it's just whew, Twilight Zone music, mind blown. All right, so we've met the cast. We've learned some fun facts. Let's get in to the scene by scene breakdown. We open on a black screen. And it says, there are thousands of miles of tunnels beneath the continental U.S. Abandoned subway systems, unused service routes, deserted mine shafts. Many have no purpose at all. And then we see an old TV and a child watching the news. They're talking about a storm that's coming. And then there's that Cans Across America commercial. And then there's an ad for the Santa Cruz Boardwalk, which just kind of really sets up the entirety of what's, what's about to happen. Next, we see our family at the boardwalk. The year is 1986. It's in the evening, dark outside. A mom, dad, young girl. The dad is playing a carnival game, and we learn it's our main character, Addie's birthday. The dad wins Addie a Michael Jackson Thriller t-shirt, and after the game, the parents are arguing a bit. The mom says that the dad isn't around much. Russell, the father, wants to get a beer, and Rain, the mom, is trying to keep him under control. She just wants them to have a nice night as a family. Russell decides to play whack-a-mole, and Rain needs to use the bathroom. She asks Russell to watch Addie while she uses the bathroom. They get a bit snippy with each other. She's like, can you just please, like, watch your daughter? Kind of implying that, like, he really doesn't do a whole lot, and he really never watches her. And he's like, yeah, I'm watching her. Like, it's fine. And he's totally got his back turned. He's not even looking at her. So it's like, you're really, you're watching her while you're playing whack-a-mole? Easy sets up that this is not a happy family dynamic for Addie to be in. So they get a bit snippy with each other, and Rain goes off to the bathroom after telling Addie to stay put. So even though her mother specifically told her not to go anywhere, Addie, of course, decides to wander off. She's got a candy apple in one hand and starts to walk toward the beach. She passes a man holding that Jeremiah 1111 sign, and she gets to the steps and walks down onto the beach. Addie is watching thunder out in the ocean behind really big storm clouds. It's actually a really cool shot. Um, And it starts to rain, and she goes into this, like, house of mirrors. She's walking around, and she gets scared by this fake owl and kind of the maze of the mirrors. 
power goes out and she starts to get a little scared as as a child would when you know they've wandered off and now they're in an attraction that has no power and she sees an exit sign and you know good sign perfect easy way to find your way out but not necessarily in a hall of mirrors and so as she's walking straight for the exit sign she runs smack into a mirror she's slowly trying to find the exit trying not to bump her head in any more mirrors and she starts whistling, I think just to kind of like calm her anxiety a little bit. It's a really cool shot because you see um, like Madison Curry kind of all over the place with all of these different mirrors. And then she hears other whistling, not her whistling, different tune, different speed. And she backs up to what we think is a mirror until she turns around. But the mirror person doesn't move. We just still see their back. And so Addie it looks like, is looking at her own back. We get this great shot of Addie looking completely terrified, like the hugest eyes I have ever seen on a child, just so scared. And then we have a close-up of a rabbit in a cage. The opening credits start to roll, and it slowly zooms out to reveal a ton of rabbits in cages. And this is when the chanting nonsense song starts playing. Now we're in the present day, and there's a car driving down the road. It's sunny. Feels like summer. A family's in the car. Mom, dad, two kids. Addie and her family. The dad is driving, and they get to their destination. He jokingly scares the kids and is yelling because they're asleep in the back seat. They unpack the car, and, like, the dad, Winston Duke, who plays Gabe, is just a total, like, this role is so perfect, and I want to see him as the lame dad in absolutely every movie that I watch from now on. Uh, because he just, the comedic timing, like I said, when I introduced him, is so good. And so he's just making terrible dad jokes. You know, I think, like, they go in, I'm guessing they unpack, because then the next time we see them is at the, the, the table eating. And the son, Jason, asks if they can get a dog. Addie quickly says no. Meanwhile, Gabe, the dad, is trying to convince the daughter, Zora, to run slash train while they're at the beach. She runs track and field. And so he's explaining that, you know, there's a lot more resistance on the sand. And so, like, if you train with the resistance, then once you get on concrete or, you know, a track, you just zoom. She's saying that she's not sure if she wants to keep running. And the parents are shocked. Addie and Gabe are so surprised. They're, you know, well, what about the Olympics? And she's like, I'm not good enough to go to the Olympics. And Addie's like, you could do anything you set your mind to. And then Zora really twist the conversation. She goes, well, what about driving? Like, I want to learn to drive. That's what I set my mind to. Classic teenage move. Um, again, Zora just really gives me final girl vibes, which I love. Um, Lori Strode and Sydney Prescott, I think would be proud. We learn that this is a house that they're used to coming to on vacation. This is a typical vacation home that they have. Gabe says that they're going to go to Santa Cruz to meet up with family friends, but no one seems excited except for him. Uh, Zora rolls her eyes. Addie, you know, is kind of pretending to to do that, like, uh, I don't know if you ever had, like, parents kind of, like, try to argue but not argue, where it's like, oh, I wasn't aware that that was a plan. Like, you should have told me type of thing. But so they have a little thing, and Gabe's like, oh, like, it'll be fun. Like, they're excited to see us. And Jason gets up and goes and finds this, like, magic trick thing. I guess it's supposed to, like, spark or something like that when he, you know, like, snaps his fingers together. And he's trying to get it to work. He said that he left it there when they were there last time, but it's not working. And so then we have this flashback memory of young Addie at a doctor's office. And her parents were talking about when she wandered off and how now she's not talking. The doctor said that they should just encourage her to do art or dance as a way of expressing herself. Possibly writing might be better. Addie's playing in a small little sandbox and watching slash listening to all of this happening. Her mom's having a really hard time and crying, and her dad gets up and is basically like, I need to go for a smoke, and walks out, and has this really odd interaction with her. So then back to the present, Addie is talking to Gabe about how she really doesn't want to go, and he kind of guilt trips her into it by saying how much Jason wanted to go. I guess um, their grandma had just died, and so Gabe goes, you know, it's just been really hard for him. This is the first time we've been here since grandma died, and he was really looking forward to going to the beach, and Addie's just like, ah, fine, but we need to leave before it gets dark. Like, I don't want to be there when it gets dark, and he's like, of course, like, of course. So he goes in to try to kiss her, and she, like, puts up, she was, like, laying on the couch, and she's gonna, like, read a book, 
And so she puts the book in front of her face. So he kisses the book. And he's like, really? Like, you're not going to kiss me? And so then they kiss. And, like, they, they have a very sweet relationship. Like, clearly they are not her parents. But they actually seem to enjoy each other's company. So she ends up giving in and kisses him. And then she gets up to go check on the kids. She goes into the basement looking for Jason and has this flashback of dancing ballet when she was a little girl. After she wandered off, clearly. Um, Zora's in the bathroom and Jason jumps out from one of the like um, lower down cabinets kind of like under the sink area and scares her. Pretty good jump scare. Um, he then hides in the closet and has to put like this little fire truck or not a fire truck, an ambulance in between the door and like the door frame so that it doesn't shut all the way because otherwise it will lock and he will be stuck in there. Uh, Zora knows this and kicks the stopper in and he of course gets stuck. He starts banging on the door and calling for his mom. And so she goes upstairs and lets him out. And then they're kind of like bickering back and forth, Sora and Jason. And Addie's like, knock it off, you guys, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then they hear this like car horn honking is what it sounds like and yelling. So they go out to kind of, I'm guessing, the backyard area of the house where there's this little dock area down to what looks like a lake or a little, just a little area of water. And their dad is in this little tiny boat that he's bought. That's, it's called Craw Daddy. He's very, very excited. Gabe is like, look what I got. Everyone on the the dock looks very concerned and not super impressed with this little boat that he bought. (laughs) Um, The boat dies in front of them. It just kind of like gives out. And he's like, it's okay. The guy taught me how to do this. It's like, I know how to fix it. And then he just starts hitting the side of the motor to get it to start. But he's really excited and they're kind of like, Zora makes a comment like, are we all going to fit in this? Again, this is one of those instances where I don't know if it was on purpose, but we'll talk about it in another part later. I feel like they just kept putting Winston Duke, who is like a large gentleman. Like, let me see how how tall he is. Please hold. Winston Duke is six foot five. This man is six foot five and looks like a freaking lineman, like built like just this lovely, lovely man. He is, he is quite a large gentleman. Uh, and it's like, I feel like they found like the smallest little leisure boat. Cause it's not like a little like dinghy or something you'd have to like paddle. Like it's a little motor boat. I want to necessarily go say Stefara is, is the speed boat. Um, but he looks like he takes up the whole <laughs> entirety of the boat almost. Um, and it, it will look like that later on in the film when he's sitting on what's supposed to be him and Addie's bed in like their vacation home. It looks like he just takes up the whole entire bed. Anyway, that's not the point. So they are now off to the Santa Cruz beach. They're going to the boardwalk. They're going to go hang out with some family friends of theirs. In the car, Azora's trying to tell them that the government puts fluoride in the water to basically control people. No one's really listening to her, and she's like, okay, that's fine, that's right. Nobody cares about the end of the world except for me. And they're like, okay, whatever. Um, and Jason and Zora kind of get into another little sibling spat, but it's a really nice comedy moment. Jason's doing kind of the little magic trick thing that he has. He's trying to get whatever to happen, happen. Uh, you know, kind of snapping his fingers on this little thing. And Zora's like, why don't you just tell us what's going to happen and we'll picture it and then you can just stop. And he's like, well, why don't you lick my anus? And everyone in the car is like, whoa, what the heck? That's disgusting. Like, and Jason's like, well, anus isn't a curse word. And Gabe's like, well, I kind of honestly wish you would have used a curse word because like, what the heck? And so there's just, it's, they're just a lovely, normal, totally loving family. And so then I Got Five on it comes on the radio, which of course was played in the trailer for this film. They like kind of did their own spooky version with like string instruments instead, which just sounds so cool. Again, Michael Abel's just mwah, chef's kiss, a genius. And I cannot wait to see what him and Jordan do in the movie Nope, because he better be a part of it. I will be sad if he's not. And I, yeah, anyway. Just love, love a good music moment. And so they're kind of all jamming to the song in the car and um, they pull up to the coastline and Gabe gets really excited. Like they kind of come around this bend and you see just ocean and the the beach and they're getting close. But as they're pulling in and getting closer to the parking lot where they're, they're going to kind of get out, they see an ambulance on the side of the road and they're putting a man in the ambulance who looks not good. 
And it's the same man that Addie saw when she was younger who is holding the Jeremiah 1111 sign. And so this next shot is one of my favorites in the entire movie. So they go like around the ambulance and then this is when they get to the beach. And so this is the shot that I love. And it's an overhead shot. And so you see like the family walking, but what we see from the camera is like the top of their heads, but the reflection, like the shadows in the sand is them walking. Like it's, I don't know if you guys have seen those pictures, but they have these a lot of like camels in the desert. And it's, it's such a cool shot because you're like, oh yeah, no, it's a bunch of camels. Like, you know exactly what it is. And then you realize that what you're seeing is actually the shadows and not like the side view of the camels that you think you're seeing. Super cool shot, 10 out of 10. And also just really kind of contributes to the doppelganger aspect of the movie of like, there are these other people attached to like everyone else. It's, it's amazing. 10 out of 10. If you have not seen this movie, We'll try to look up the shot. I don't know what you need to look up, but it's it's solid and it's one of my favorite like four second, five second scenes in the whole movie. That and the the thunder behind the clouds. So they kind of get and meet up with the people they're supposed to meet with. This is when we meet Josh and Kitty who are married and then they have a set of twin daughters who are roughly about Zora's age, maybe a tiny bit older, like a year or two. I don't think that much older though. They look like they'd be probably right around the same age. So Kitty and Josh clearly kind of right off the bat don't seem to have the same kind of loving marriage that Addie and Gabe have. They kind of dig at each other very rudely, like Kitty's drinking some wine on the beach and Josh asks Addie if she wants anything, if she wants a drink, and she's like, no, I've got water, I'm fine. He asks his wife if she would like more and she says, yeah, and then he just kind of puts her down and he's like, I've got to get my wife her medicine. And this is her third glass. And just kind of being a total jerk. Kitty makes the comment that she wants to kill him, like, every day. She's like, I think about murdering him all the time. And you're like, oh, geez, well, I hope that's not what marriage is supposed to be. I mean, I feel like, you know, quoting Scream, there's always some stupid fucked up reason to kill your girlfriend. But, like, I feel like you shouldn't want to kill your girlfriend or your partner every single day. That maybe is not so healthy. But who am I to judge, I guess? I'm not a relationship therapist. Then we're kind of sitting on the beach with Zora and she's got music in. Uh, the twin daughters of Kitty and Josh are doing like cartwheels and they end up ruining Jason's like sand castle that he was making. They kind of suck. They just seem like kind of those like stereotypical mean girls that you'd see in like middle school or high school. Just they don't seem like the nicest duo. Uh, they're kind of weird and awkward. Kitty and Addie are talking about um, Addie dancing when she was younger and just kind of, you know, Kitty talks about how she should have been an actress and she was doing acting when she met Josh and she had been in a couple commercials and she should have made it big, but of course the girls were born at exactly the wrong time. Um, also doesn't really seem to have that super maternal instinct that Addie seems to have. And at this point, Jason wanders off because he's going to go to the bathroom. Doesn't necessarily wander off. He tells Zora, I'm going to go to the bathroom and heads over to the bathrooms. And as he's walking to the bathrooms, we see the hall of mirrors that Addie had gone into. He walks right past it to kind of get to where the bathrooms are. And Kitty and Addie are talking about coincidences, just about how they've noticed things happening lately. So like a Frisbee kind of gets tossed over in their area and lands on their beach towels. And the, you know, the circle, of course, the circle Frisbee lands perfectly in the middle of the circle on the beach towel. So they're talking about coincidences. We see Jason come out of the bathroom and he sees this man on the beach with his hands out. Almost picture like, you know, like Jesus on the cross. He's just like got his feet like, you know, a little bit less than his legs, a little bit less than shoulder width apart and his arms up. Not completely up, but like maybe three fourths of the way up, you know, so not like a perfect T, but like, you know, three fourths of the way. You only see the back of him, but they zoom in on his hand and it's dripping blood. Addie starts looking around for Jason. I feel like as any mom would do in a public area, you just kind of do like that quick scan for your kids and can't find him. So she's like, Gabe, where's Jason? Where's our son? And so they start looking for him. Addie starts totally freaking out, of course, because she knows that the Hall of Mirrors is basically directly behind them. And he walks back over a little bit confused and Addie runs to him and like drops to her knees, gives him a hug, and then kind of yells at him and shakes him a little bit of like, you cannot do that. That is not okay. And Gabe's like, all right, we're fine. Like everything's okay. Or we found him. It's okay. So they all go back home and Gabe's kind of ranting about how Josh 
it bought this car just to rub it in Gabe's face. He's like, did you see the new car that he bought? They kind of have this whole keeping up with the Joneses thing going on. Uh, that's kind of why Gabe bought the boat. You'll learn that later. Uh, or you kind of learned that on the beach because um, Josh is talking to Gabe about like, oh, so you bought the boat. Like, did you get all the stuff for it? And just kind of making Gabe feel crappy for not having as cool of a boat and all of the stuff that Josh has. And so Gabe, you know, clearly feels a little bit inferior to Josh, even though I would much rather hang out with Gabe than Josh because Josh kind of seems like a jerk. Addie goes off to say goodnight to the kids and she chats with Jason about him wandering off and she kind of makes a comment that she's going to keep him safe as long as he stays close to her. Like she's not going to let anything happen to him, but he needs to not like wander off because that was really scary. And she finds this drawing in his room of the man on the beach. And so it's a really interesting drawing because it's like the back of the back of Jason's head looking in the direction of the man that like we just see his back on the beach. So it's almost like there's a third person standing watching that happen. Like you know, basically kind of like what the audience saw. It's a really cool drawing. So she says goodnight to him, says goodnight to Zora, and then she goes into kind of the master bedroom and Gabe's talking about wanting to go fishing. He's like, we should take the boat out. We should go get some fishing poles, take the kids fishing. And Addie's just staring out the window, not saying anything. And Gabe crawls into bed, acting like they're going to fool around. And he kind of gets in and he just goes, hey. And this is when, <laughs> the kind of what I was talking about with the boat, he takes up this whole bed. Like, I do not know what size bed this was. And I get that you probably only go to your summer home for a week at a time, maybe three weeks out of the whole year. So you're not going to buy like the biggest, most comfortable bed. But I'm, just, I'm like, I want to see the two of them in that bed sleeping because I feel like, I mean, Lupita is a very petite woman and she is small, but that bed just looks too small. Like it almost looks like it doesn't even fit Winston Duke, like lengthwise. Anyway, he just looks silly though, all kind of like spread out on this bed, looking like he's going to get something from his wife. And then it's like, you don't even, I don't even know. It's funny. Anyway. So Gabe crawls into bed acting like they're going to kind of fool around a little bit, but Addie tells him that she wants to leave. She's like, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go home. And he's obviously super surprised. She tells him that she doesn't feel like herself. She tells him about wandering off as a child and seeing that girl that looks just like her. Um, you know, she's clearly really scared and shaken up. She's not even talking to him. She's like talking to his reflection in the window because she's still just like intently staring out the window. Then she goes and sits next to him and he's like, well, but you were in the hall of mirrors, kind of implying that the girl that she saw was just a reflection of herself. And she's like, absolutely not. I know what I saw. It was not someone else. It was, or it was not me. It was someone else. Like there was someone else with me. She gets a little bit upset and says that he doesn't understand. She talks again about the coincidences and he's still not really getting it. Of course, I mean, that would be kind of a lot to just throw on a person. You know, and of course he wasn't there when she was little and this clearly had a big impact on her. And he's trying to understand, but he's just having a hard time. He doesn't know, he's confused as to why he never knew about this, why he never knew that this happened when she was a girl. And he makes a bad joke, <laughs> which he's like, he goes, it's fine. I'm pretty sure I could kick your ass. So if she looks like you, then he like, then he like makes a punching gesture like toward her arm. You know, like when you like punch someone on the arm, like good job, sport or fake punching. Um, and it's just, and she, and she's like almost in tears and she just looks at him with this like, are you fucking kidding me right now? And he's like, okay, sorry, bad joke. And at this time he gets up to like start apologizing and then the power goes out. Addie screams. He's like, okay, hold on. It's just the power. Like, we need a... And then he kind of makes a comment. He's like, this is why Josh has a backup generator. Like, this is why we need a backup generator. Again, comparing himself to Josh all of the time. He goes to leave the room, I'm guessing, to kind of go to the breaker box and hopefully get the power back on. And Jason is just standing in the doorway. So as Gabe goes to leave, he sees Jason standing there and he yells. And then Addie yells. And then I'm pretty sure Gabe... Or I'm pretty sure Jason yells. <laughs> and he's like, Jesus, it was just the power, like, go back to bed, it's fine. And Jason just very casually says, there's a family in our driveway. And Gabe's like, there's not a family in our driveway. And then they're standing at kind of the front door area looking out the window, and he's like, huh, there's a family in our driveway. And Addie calls 911. She is having absolutely none of it. 
And they're like, we'll be there in 15 minutes. And she's like, that is not. 15 minutes is not fast enough. You guys need to be here sooner than that. Gabe is like, stop calling 911. It's fine. It's just a family. Why are you guys scared of a family? Like, maybe they're lost. Maybe. So he decides that he's going to put shoes on and go outside to talk with them. Addie is begging him not to. She's like, please do not go out there. He's like, it's fine. It's not that big of a deal. He goes outside and asks them to leave, but they are not moving. They don't even budge. He gets a little creeped out and goes back inside to get a bat to try and scare them off. And so he goes out and he's like, I already asked you to get off my property. Like, stop trying to scare people. This isn't okay. Um, You know, trying to be all kind of tough and intimidating. But he's just not, he's not that kind of person, even at six foot five. And then we hear this clicking sound and two of the people in this like family of four or this group of four break off and run around the side of the house. And so he goes back inside. He locks the front door. He's like, they're coming around through the back. Is the back door locked? Zora at this point has come out into kind of where they're standing by the front door. And she realizes that her window's open. So she runs into her room to basically shut and lock her window. And we see someone climbing up the tree right outside her window. Like super creepy shot. It looks very animalistic. Just like we hear... And see someone walking up to the front door just kind of whistling. And we can see that they've got these big, giant scissors. And they remind me of the scissors in Hercules that the fates use to cut people's strings when they're going to die. And I don't know why, but that's every time I watch this movie, that's what I think of when I see these giant scissors that everyone has. Is like very, It's very symbolic of Hercules to me and the fates. And kind of Greek mythology. So someone's coming up to the front door and they're trying to break through the door, like pounding on it. And then it gets kind of quiet and they find the hide a key and they're able to get inside. And so Gabe runs up as the door is unlocking and puts all of his weight against it. But they're able to get inside or, or whoever's outside is able to get their hand inside. They take the bat from Gabe and they smack his leg with it. And this is like a, like a, just a, aluminum bat so gonna be painful probably busted his leg definitely broke his leg he falls can't get up and these people are able to get into the house so Gabe can't stand Addie has the kids huddled together she basically has Zora like around almost like around the throat area just like keeping her hugged to him or hugged to her and then she's got Jason kind of a little bit lower just because of like height stuff but she's got the kids connected to her. But now all of these intruders are in the house. And I don't know if you've seen The Strangers, but this movie also kind of plays off of that vibe in the beginning, which I love so much because The Strangers is so deliciously spooky. They're all in these red jumpsuits and they all have these really long scissors like I had talked about. And the as... as the the leader, I guess you could say, comes into the house and gets closer to where Addie and the kids are standing. She gestures for them to sit down. And we can see that that one looks like Addie. That one looks very much like Addie. Hair is different, but everything else, identical. And so she gestures for them to sit down. They end up all sitting down. And so they're standing basically just looking at their doppelganger images of each other. The one that looks like Jason lights a fire. And so they can all clearly see that they are us. That's what Jason says. He said they're us. And so then the one that looks like Addie starts to talk and she tells the story of the tethered. And she also has this really raspy voice that kind of goes in and out. Red says that they are... And so this this, um, doppelganger who looks like Addie, her name is Red. So Red says that they're shadows of real people, two halves of a whole, two bodies, one soul. The tethered eat rabbits. They don't get toys. She talks about how she had to marry Abraham because the girl, Addie, married Gabe. And Abraham was tethered to Gabe. And so she didn't get to pick who she loved. Red says that she gave birth to a monster girl. And then when she gave birth to her second child, Addie had to have a C-section And Red talks about how she had to cut herself open and take the baby out because they don't have, you know, doctors in kind of the underpass is what it's called, what Jordan Peele calls it. You know, they don't get good food. They have to just eat rabbits. 
which is where all the rabbits come from. They don't get toys. They just get sharp, cold things to play with. Um, Red talks about how much she hates Addie. So she decided to pull all of the tethered people together and decided that it was their time to live into the, in the light. Red says that famous line, we're Americans. She makes Addie tether herself to the table and Addie begs them, all of them, all of the, the tethered people, not to hurt her children. She's like, I didn't, didn't say anything about Gabe. She's like, please don't hurt my children, which I feel like is a very typical mom thing. Like, you know, and Gabe should understand that. I think that that's valid. I think Gabe would have probably said the same thing. Um, so Abraham takes Gabe outside to kill him. He knocks Gabe out, takes his glasses, and basically puts him in the boat. Red tells Zora to run, and the tethered um, version of Zora chases her out of the house because they um, they ran track. Zora ran, ran track, so of course the tethered version of her can also run fairly well. Um, Jason then takes the little boy to play in the closet with him, and Addie tells Jason to show him one of his tricks. And so Jason learns in while they're kind of in the closet together, just like sitting looking at each other, that his tethered will mimic his movements much like a mirror. So he, Jason, throughout the film, wears this, like, I don't know if it's supposed to be a Chewbacca mask. That's what it reminds me of. It looks like this, like, monster mask thing. And so he pulls his mask up, and his tethered wears this white, like, mask thing. And so the tethered also pulls his up. And so you see that the his tethered is all burnt. Like, his skin is all kind of... Like, he had actually accidentally been caught on fire. Um, so the lower part of his face, like his chin area, his lips, are all burnt looking. Healed, but, you know, like he, he had been severely burned. So Zora runs and her tethered catches up with her. She's, like, kind of hiding behind a car on this street. And the tethered gets on the roof of the car and is right, basically ready to jump on Zora. And then the owner of the car comes out of the house and... That gives Zora just enough time to run away. Her tethered stabs the car owner because he's like, little girl, I need to talk to you. Or young lady, like, get over here. I need to talk to you. And she stabs him. Addie and Red are talking and Addie asks what they want. Red says that they want to take their time. They've been waiting for this day. And she calls this the untethering. Uh, which is kind of what, what also reminds me of the scissors. Like, I think that they're like you know, they're having to kill the other person that they're connected to. But I also see it as like cutting the string so that they can live. It's, it's very interesting. A lot of symbolism in this movie, but it always reminds me of Hercules and Greek mythology and the fates, which Gabe wakes up and he is on the boat and Abraham is driving. Uh, so Gabe's able to get up and hit Abraham off the boat. And then the boat had kind of like sputtered and died. And then he was getting ready to turn around and the boat like kicked itself back on and Gabe ends up falling off the boat. So he's in the middle of whatever kind of lake uh, body of water this is. And he's just kind of floating. Um, Jason is able to get out of the closet and trap his tethered, whose name is Pluto, inside. He puts the little, like, stopper on the door and is able to, like, kind of get out quickly and close the door so that Pluto gets stuck inside. And so Pluto starts pounding on the door, much like Jason did in the beginning when he got stuck in there. And Addie's like, that's yours. That one's yours. And so Red goes to check on the boys, and Addie's able to break the table to get away. So she basically takes a fire poker and, like, breaks the board that she had um, put the other, like, chain, handcuff, whatever you want to call it, um, on. So that she can just slip it off. She's got a fire poker in one hand, and she's going through the house. She's going to find her son. Then we go back to the lake, and we see the Gabe still floating. And in the beginning, when he kind of shows the family the, the boat, he makes the comment that the boat hangs to the left. So it ends up being able to circle back around, and Gabe's able to get on. As he's trying to climb on the boat, though, Abraham grabs him from the water, but Gabe is able to kick the motor on, and Abraham basically becomes hamburger. So we've got our first uh, on-screen death of, of the film. So Addie's walking through the house looking for Jason. She finds him, but they end up getting chased by Pluto. Zora shows up around that time as well, and Gabe's driving the boat up to the dock to save them. He drives away just in time, leaving Red and Pluto behind on the dock, but Zora's tethered ends up running after them, like, on land. So she's, you know, they're kind of in the water, and she's on land running after the boat in that direction. So then we jump to Kitty and Josh's house. It's much bigger, much fancier than their 
you know, than Addie and Gabe's kind of little vacation home. But Addie and Gabe's home feels a lot more homey and just, like, comfortable. Yeah, Josh and Kitty's is, is super fancy, like, very modern glass walls. Just, it's, it's a bit much. Um, Kitty and Josh kind of have a little argument because Kitty says that she heard something coming from outside. Josh is like, it's probably nothing. It's probably just, like, a squirrel or an animal. He's kind of just being a jerk. She says that she's scared, so he needs to go check it out. So he's like, okay, fine. So he asks Ophelia, which is basically the show's, the film's version of Alexa, to turn the lights on because he had been sitting downstairs by the fire drinking in the dark. He messes with her and he's like, oh my gosh, I see something outside. Like there's something outside. It's by the car. And she's like, I don't see anything, Josh. Where is it? And he's like, it's OJ. OJ's out there. We have to call the police. It's like, okay, whatever. So they argue a little bit more and Josh asks for Ophelia to turn on the Beach Boys. And the twins come out of their room to kind of see what's going on uh, because the lights had like flickered. And so they thought, you know, that they lost power, but the backup generator kicked in. So everything was fine. They told them to go back to bed. But as they're talking to the twins, their tethered counterparts show up and kill them all. So we see the twins uh, tethered come in first. And then it's like a shot from outside the house with these kind of glass walls. And we see Josh and Kitty get killed by their counterparts they're tethered and so kitty's still hanging on a little bit they didn't her tether didn't do as good of a job um cutting her and so she's trying to crawl her way on the floor over to josh and she looks up at the the tether that looks like josh and says please stop and so then ophelia stops playing the like the beach boys music is good vibrations very interesting murder song <laughs> and then She asks Ophelia to call the police, but because she's dying and she's kind of sputtering blood, Ophelia starts playing Fuck the Police by N.W.A. And so it's such a good comedic moment because you're just like, ah, no, like, Ophelia, that's not what I asked because it's like, call the police. Okay, playing Fuck the Police by N.W.A. And then, like, fucking Ice Cube goes in and you're like, oh, no. Um, So that happens. Uh, They end up finishing off Kitty. And uh, soon after that, Addie and her family show up at that house and soon realize that their friends are dead. She hits Josh with a fire poker and he's able to drag her inside. Gabe is limping. He's able to lead the tethered Josh away and toward kind of the boats and the dock area. Zora and Jason go into the house and Zora grabs this golf club that was sitting by the front door. And Jason ends up grabbing this like giant geode. Really cool. They basically go to help find their mom. NWA is still playing in the background. They get upstairs and they run into the tethered twins. Zora kills both of them. Uh, One by just kind of, uh, she jumps out and scares her and Zora just smacks her in the head with the golf club. And she just ends up toppling over the railing and onto this glass coffee table and supposedly dies, presumably dies. And then the next one is kind of like doing cartwheels in the hallway and Zora beats the heck out of her with this golf club. Like, very intense and Jason's just seeing the whole time like eyes wide like oh my gosh like that's oh it was very intense but again those are the final girl vibes that I love to see so good job Zora 10 out of 10. Gabe uh, leads Josh to the boats and Addie is stuck on the bed uh Kitty has kind of put the like cuff things that she has on the bed and so she's stuck Addie's stuck on the floor and kind of, I'm guessing, like, the master bedroom. Uh, Kitty is looking at herself in the mirror and putting on, like, lipstick, having kind of, uh, like, that moment when we see Georgina looking at herself in her reflection, like, in the window, and she's, like, looking at, she's, like, fixing her hair and she's touching her face, and Kitty's having that moment where she's just totally feeling herself, and she goes to what you think is possibly kill Addie, And then she just is, like, shaking in front of her because it's almost like she wants to, but she can't. Like, Red gave them very specific instructions that they were only supposed to kill their counterparts. They weren't supposed to kill anyone else. Um, So she ends up actually going to the mirror and cutting, like, a line in her own cheek instead of hurting Addie. It's very interesting. Very cult-like. Again, back to the idea of the cult. She doesn't do stuff she's not supposed to so gabe tries to shoot josh with a flare gun which of course doesn't do 
anything. They fight in the boat, but Gabe's able to win. Uh, Zora walks in as Kitty is looking out the window, or the, the tethered Kitty is looking out the window, and tries to hit her over the head with the golf club. But Kitty turns around at exactly the right moment and, gr- like, midair just grabs the golf club and tries to kill Zora right in front of Addie. Like, Addie is stuck on the bed, and Kitty's basically going to, I think, strangle Zora in front of her mom, which is just very intense. So she's telling her to stop, yelling at her no. Jason comes in and hits Tethered Kitty over the head with the geode and kills her. Um, I got five on and starts playing again. And Gabe has now made his way back to the house and knocks on the door. He's like, I'm done with boats. I don't care about boats anymore. I hate boats. Boats are done. They're all sitting in the house now with all the bodies and trying to get a hold of 911. So they keep being put on hold and they decide that they're going to that they're going to look on TV and kind of see if this is happening all over. And when they turn on the news, they do, in fact, see that this is kind of happening all over the United States. And so the the tethered people, I guess, are standing in a line holding hands after killing their counterparts. Um, They're also all wearing the red jumpsuits. And people said that they are coming out of the sewers. Addie's like, we need to get out of here. We should go to Mexico. We need to get out of the States. And Gabe's like, no, we should stay here. We have everything we need. They argue for a bit and Addie Addy basically says, I'm in charge now. You're not making decisions anymore. They decide to take Josh and Kitty's car and Addie ends up having to go back in for the keys because nobody thought to grab them. And she's attacked by the one twin who wasn't dead, the one that kind of went over the railing that um, Zora hit the first time. They fight and Addie wins, but Jason sees her kill the tethered and kind of becomes a bit intense, almost animal-like. She's panting and grunting and just like super in it and she sees Jason and then quickly like composes herself and they leave together but you know with everything happening it wouldn't be the weirdest thing for her to kind of be losing it a little bit I feel like that's valid Zora's in the driver's seat and she's arguing that she should be the one to drive she's like dad's legs messed up you're still handcuffed it's not safe she says also I had the highest kill count because I killed both the twins and Addie's like no because I just had to kill one of the twins that wasn't actually dead Then Jason pipes in with, well, I killed Kitty. And then Gabe's like, well, I killed myself and I killed Josh. So I have the highest kill count. But at this moment when they're still kind of arguing, Zora's tethered shows up. And Addie just decides to get in the car and let Zora drive because it's safer than arguing about it. Zora tries to hit the tethered with the car, but she jumps in at the last second and starts trying to stab the windshield and keeps trying to stab Zora through the windshield. Zora speeds up really fast and then slams on the brakes, basically throwing the tethered into this line of trees. So Addie gets out to kind of check things out and the tethered has been impaled on a tree branch. She's just really laughing kind of maniacally and then she dies. Addie decides that she's going to drive after that. At this point, the sun has come up and they drive toward the coast. The family's okay so far. They've all survived the night. Uh, They turn into this parking lot area and they see their car, like their own family car, on fire. Because remember, they're in Kitty and Josh's car. Addie stops and they hear something coming from under the car they're driving. Addie backs up and Pluto, Jason's tethered, is there. Addie gets out and goes up to him. He's standing there just kind of snapping his fingers. And... Addie takes off his mask to reveal that his face is all burned. Like, the same face that, like, Jason saw, but Addie hadn't seen it yet. Jason's like, oh, no, this is a trap. We need to get out of the car. Because Addie had told them, nobody get out of the car. Stay here. Pluto had actually got under the car and cut the fuel line and was planning to blow the car up. So then he reveals that he's got a match in his hand. The, the same hand that he was kind of snapping his fingers. So Jason ends up doing the mimic thing and, like, puts his hands like his arms up and starts backing up. And so he makes Pluto back himself into the fire that's burning around their family car. And Addie's telling Pluto not to. She's like, no, don't, you don't have to do that. But he does, he kind of goes up in flames. And then we see Red kind of show up in the background and she snatches Jason and takes off with him. So Gabe's like, oh my gosh, Jason, where did he go? And Addie runs off after him to the Hall of Mirrors. She knows exactly where Red is taking him. She walks through the boardwalk, which is empty except for a few dead bodies. Once she gets to the beach, she sees a ton of tethered people, hands joined in the line, some in the water, others on the sand, just all holding hands together. There's this really good contrast with, like, the sun and the beach, and it just, 
it just looks so warm and inviting outside. And then she's in this like beige kind of lounge outfit, like sleep outfit that's just covered in blood splotches. <laughs> so she goes into the hall and she finds the spot where she saw red years ago. She finds a staircase that goes down and she follows it. She's walking under the attraction and then she finds even more stairs leading down. After a few more sets of stairs, she finds like an escalator. And as she's kind of slowly walking deeper and deeper and deeper down into the underpass, she the, the music gets really, really intense. And it just like picks up and it gets louder and even more, more strings and yeah, more intensity. Uh, and so then she's following, riding this escalator down, which really reminds me of the tube in London. Like, just seems like such a weird comparison, but like just the escalator with the bare walls on the side just reminds me of London. So once downstairs, she's in this giant hallway and there's just rabbits loosely walking around everywhere, hanging out. She starts looking for Red and Jason. Back on the ground, Gabe and Zora find an ambulance and they also see a line of people. So Addie ends up, while she's underground looking for them, she ends up in this room that looks kind of like a classroom. There's like a chalkboard and there's all these like little desks with the chairs and the little desk attached to it. She sees Red and her back is to Addie. So Red further explains that the government made copies of people in order to control them. Again, one soul, two bodies. She thinks that they that they failed, but that the tethered went on without them. And then there was us, she said. We see the boardwalk night again this time, but from Red's point of view, everything's the same, but everything's happening in that hallway. You know, she get her dad wins her the t-shirt. They're walking through the boardwalk. She sees people eating, but instead of eating what I think was like French fries or something, they're eating rabbit. Uh, she sees people who are pretending to be on the, like, roller coaster. She sees, you know, her dad is basically punching against the wall, but that's when he's playing whack-a-mole. She says that God brought them together that night. Red says that she never stopped thinking about her. Red's like, you could have taken me with you. You didn't have to leave me behind. And when Addie started dancing... Red would also dance, but, like, in front of the tethered. And so the tethered thought that because she could dance and do this amazing thing, that she was a prophet. And so Red kind of led them to this day. She spent years planning this. She didn't just want to kill Addie. She wanted to make a statement that you can't just forget about us. You can't just leave us behind. We're not just going to go away, basically. Um, and then during this scene, we also keep seeing a hands across America shirt, like taped to the wall. And so that's why everyone is lined up and in red, because on the shirt, there's all these little people that are, you know, linked together. And it's just, they're just red to make a statement. That was the whole, the whole thing. Uh, red makes the comment, it's our time now. And while she was talking, Red was making basically a paper chain of people, you know, holding hands. And then she separates them. So then there's this lovely scene I don't know if lovely is the right word. There's this great scene where the I Got Five on it instrumental music starts playing with the, like, strings and the piano. Super great. And they have this little, like, dance. I don't, I hate calling it a dance battle because it's not. That sounds so step up to. Um, but they have this very intricate, like, step fight thing. That seems very, very dance-like, very choreographed, um, almost like chess. And so Red ends up leaving the room and Addie follows her. And kind of like chess, Addie's really struggling. Red seems to have the upper hand. Red is able to counter every single move and every single step that Addie takes. And so she ends up following Red into basically the bunk room where people sleep. There's like all these little bunk beds. And that just seems to be what that room is for, is just for sleeping. Red pops out and Addie finally lands a hit and impales her with a fire poker. Then she takes the cuffs off and strangles, or she takes the cuffs and strangles Red because they're like, they're a pretty long chain. There's probably a good two feet, maybe a foot and a half of chain in between like the two cuffs areas. Um, and so she strangles Red. Addie goes kind of animalistic again and she's like screaming and grunting and panting she ends up finding the key on red and is finally able to take the handcuffs off. And then she hears something in these, like, coming from, like, this locker area. 
and she finds Jason inside one of them. She pulls him out and she like tries to push her hair out of her face and show him that it's her and that he's safe now and that no one's ever going to hurt him again. Jason and Addie come out and find Zora and Gabe in the ambulance. Addie decides to drive and she has a flashback from the boardwalk night again. And this is where we find out for sure that Addie is actually a tethered. Addie is actually red. She attacked the real Addie and chained her up in the tethered place and took her place in the real world that night on her birthday. Once she snaps back to driving, Jason's just staring at her. Like, he knows something's wrong. Like, I think he has put it together by this point that, like, maybe his mom isn't actually who or what she says she is. Um, Addie just smiles at him and turns her attention back to driving. And that's why only Red could talk. None of the other tethered could talk. But Red could because she actually grew up in in the upper world. I don't know what you'd call it. In, in the ground level world. Um, but Addie strangled her and messed up her vocal cords. So that's why her speech was very um, kind of sporadic and wheezy. It's very chilling. And it does show that the tethered people maybe weren't bad guys. Like, maybe they just got a bad rap. Maybe they just, they were pushed into making a statement. You know, sometimes, I remember I took a class um, and, and we were talking about, like, uh, how when things happen and people choose to riot. People choose to, you know, maybe make what the media portrays as bad decisions. And my sociology professor made the comment that sometimes the only rational decision is an irrational decision like the only thing that makes sense in the moment is something that seems irrational because otherwise no one's going to pay attention um and so I think that that's that's really interesting and, and I kind of think about that when when I watch this movie but it shows that you know like Addie clearly you know the Addie that had Zora and Jason is is a tethered clearly seems to have a soul has what seems to be a great relationship with her husband has two lovely kids who seem well-rounded and supported and loved by both of their parents. And, you know, who's the bad guy? And maybe there isn't one, but I just, it's such a great twist. And I remember the first time I was like, there's something's going to be up with this. Like they keep showing this boardwalk scene. They keep showing them meeting. And I feel like we have not gotten the whole story. And then when I got that, I was like, oh, Jordan, you son of a gun. Like, you oh, you've done it again. And I friggin' love you for it. Anyway, so one of the last things that we see is the ambulance driving. And then there's this shot, this like overhead shot over the country. And we see even more of the tethered in a line, just a big red line across the United States. And that is the end of us. So great. I love it just thinking about that scene where, like, the real, like, the Addie that we've known throughout the movie, finding out that she's actually the tethered version is just phenomenal. Such a great twist. I just, I just love Jordan Peele so much. And I cannot wait to see his new movie. And I swear, if anybody on Twitter ruins it for me because they spend 20 hours watching the trailer, I will cry. And I will lose it because I just want that one moment of what the fuck. <sighs> also, Kiki Palmer and Daniel Kaluuya, like. Mm -hmm. All right. So now that we have touched on the movie, there are a few resources that I'm going to give below. Just kind of talking about how Us relates to the bigger picture of black horror and how it fits in with all of that. Definitely less... Um, you know, racially driven and, you know, trauma, pain, horror, like, you know, Get Out and some of the other, you know, black horror movies that are made. I know that um, this came out around the same time, I think, as the movie Antebellum, um, which is very much like that black trauma, horror, pain um, aspect. And so there are, of course, I picked articles that are from Tanina Reevedu because I just love her so much. Um, but there's one that she did. She did this kind of round table with Brooke Obi for Shadow and Act. And it's called Jordan Peele on the Intentional Blackness of Us. And so basically they just talk about like um, casting and how 
the whole entire, you know, the, the main family of Addie and Gabe and Jason and Zora is just a beautiful, dark-skinned, normal, black family. Um, and so they talk about that. And then there's another article, um, or I guess technically it's an essay by Tanana Reevdu that's Jordan Peele's Us, Black Horror Comes Out of the Shadows. And so it's a piece that she did for Medium. Uh, so I'll have those linked below. And then I will also have a another video where Tanana Reevdu and her husband, Stephen Barnes, talk about us and just kind of their thoughts on it, how they liked it, what they liked about it, um, how they feel about, you know, kind of it fitting in with the Black Horror subgenre or genre and... Yeah, I just think that those pieces are really important. And again, do your own research, come up with your own conclusions, but important to think about. Um, you know, this film did so well. It, I don't think it was nominated for anything. I know that Get Out won Best Original Screenplay. It didn't win anything, but those resources will be listed below. I would encourage everyone to check it out. I have really just enjoyed diving into Tanana Rivdu and her husband Stephen Barnes's work. They are a delight and I have just been kind of binging all of the stuff that I can find with the two of them because I just um, really enjoy hearing their points of view on these topics and I think it's really important to think and consider, um, especially when us as the consumers are what can help drive, um, you know, what we see in in the cinema and I want to see more movies like us. I want to see more inclusivity on the screen and the best way to do that is to encourage people to see these movies, hype them up when they're getting ready to come out. I can't wait to do a ton of stuff um, trying to hype up Nope before it comes out because I'm just so freaking excited about it. Um, but yeah, so again, just do your research and make sure that you're you're thinking about the the important bits and that we're giving money to things that are going to be inclusive and hopefully not traumatizing people when they see it um, and constantly bringing up that old pain um, that ancestral pain that's that's brought up over and over and over and over again in what would be considered like stereotypical black horror movies but yeah so that is what I have to say for us those resources will be listed in the description of the podcast episode I hope that you enjoyed it I am super excited for next week. We are next week. We will be talking about the original Wicker Man. We're sticking with the cult idea. Super excited. Um, not the Nicolas Cage version. We're going to be talking about the original Wicker Man. Super excited to rewatch that. I've not seen that one in a few years. So that one will be fun. I hope that you enjoyed it. Again, if you like the podcast, please like, comment, and subscribe. That would be amazing. We are on Spotify and Apple Podcasts under Megan's Murder Movies, and we are also on social media under M Murder Movies. So that's M as in Massacre, Murder Movies.